Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Today's special guest on the show is Athol Duncan. He's the chair of the leadership development business Black Isle Group. He's also worked for the BBC as a journalist for over 20 years and been head of the BBC News Scotland. He's also a certified coach and author. But before we get a chance to speak with Athol, it's the Leadership Hacker News. I just love it when emerging technology and entrepreneurism come together. In a press release this week, Warner Music and Accenture Interactive announced Saylists, new playlists exclusive to Apple Music, and they're designed to augment the speech therapy experience for young people through the power of music and technology. There are 173 tracks in these playlists, including Dua Lipa's Don't Start Now and Lizzo's Good As Hell, and the BBC reported that some 1 in 12 children across the United Kingdom experience some form of speech disorder or SSD and it's also common across the globe. Stammering or stuttering as it's often referred to affects at least 1.5 million children in the UK alone. Using an algorithm, Apple analysed the lyrics of its catalogue's 70 billion songs to identify the sounds most commonly repeated in speech. As such, the playlists are centred on the sounds of ch D, F, G, K, L, R, S, T, as an example. They're frenetic sounds that you and I just take for granted. Warner's press release includes comments from speech and language psychologists, all of whom say that these say lists are an innovative form of therapy. Every speech and language therapist wants to keep children engaged during therapy sessions as well as help them generalise their target sounds, both at school and at home, said Anna Biavata Smith. Sailists provide fun new ways to practice sounds without feeling pressured or getting bored and having fun of course is first step on the rung of learning. So for those that are listening, these new playlists are available to Apple Music subscribers worldwide now and I just wanted to call out what a great piece of innovation that was. That's been the Leadership Hacking News. If you have any interesting news, stories or facts that you'd like our listeners to hear, then please get in touch. Athol Duncan is a special guest on today's show. He's a chair of leadership development business, Black Hole Group. He's worked as a journalist, TV producer, and as an ex-executive of the BBC for over 20 years. He's now the author of Leaders in Lockdown. Athol, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the chat. Now, we're going to get into the Leaders in Lockdown very soon. And I should imagine the 12 months of having penned the book to kind of where we are now has been a really interesting one. But for those listeners that haven't had a chance to maybe experience your work before, perhaps you can give us a sense of what it is you've done in the past to how you are now. Sure. Well, well, Steve, my, my life has really been in three acts. Uh, act number one, as you were explaining there, um, I worked at the BBC for a couple of decades covering the world's uh, main uh, stories, really, the, the world's big stories. And then act number two, um, I had an executive career uh, as a bit of a transformation uh, expert, and um, I worked in the utility sector, I worked in the media sector, and I worked in professional services, um, trying to transform businesses. And then Act 3 is where I am now, hopefully not my final act, and that's really with a portfolio of uh, non-executive roles, um, sitting on a few boards, and also as an executive coach, and as you say, uh, now rather scarily as an author. And did you find that as part of your career evolution and your various different acts of your career at all, there was perhaps a specific trigger or event that caused you to move from one direction to another? 
Well, I think the, the the trigger in the most recent events was, you know, a coming to, a coming together of myself as a business leader and as a storyteller. And there was one particular morning when I was uh, walking on the beach uh, near my house in Scotland. The previous day, I'd had seven emergency board meetings uh, because of COVID, and I was pretty stressed uh, to say the least. But I realised that this was a remarkable period of history that we were going through, probably the defining months uh, of this century. And I wanted to capture it and capture it in this book, Leaders in Lockdown, um, by spending time with 28 global business leaders and asking them how they coped with the crisis and how the world was going to change because of the scary events that we were all going through. And delightful that you did. And we're going to get into some of those lessons that you found from some of those leaders shortly. I think it's quite an interesting moment in time when you look back on the world that we're in at the moment to recognise that we are probably at a very pivotal stage in our global history. And I think not only will the way that we behave change, the way that we interact across businesses will change, but lots of other dynamics that we haven't even experienced yet will be become apparent over the next few years. What, what's your view on that? I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, you know, part of um, the theory of the book is that every long-held uh, belief in business has been thrown out of the window by COVID. Um, and I think, you know, we, we see that um, many trends in behaviours and consumer behaviours and business behaviours have really moved on probably a decade um, in a summer. So the change is massive and how we cope with that as leaders is something that deserves thorough introspection um, and great debate. So what's the focus of the work that you're currently doing with Black Isle Group? Well, Black Isle Group is is really um, picking up from the challenges of of COVID. And we've kind of set ourselves a purpose of changing the face of leadership development. A few of us have been on the other side, have been on the receiving end of uh, leadership development through our careers as business leaders. And we came to the conclusion that quite a lot of um, what is done in the leadership development world is not fit for the future. So we've created a new approach. Um, We call it the big approach. And it essentially brings together a new coaching culture in businesses, a new methodology, and it marries that up with some technology that we've created, which is called nudge technology. And through this um, new big approach, we've set ourselves the purpose of trying to help businesses create a new mindset, a new pace of change, and really embed new habits and new behaviours which set them up to cope with the very new and high-paced and agile demands of the post-COVID world. So you use the word mindset there, and I wholeheartedly concur that in order to face into our future, I suspect we're going to have to have a very different mindset than perhaps one we did before the COVID pandemic. But if you think about your portfolio of clients that you work with and businesses that you support in your non-exec roles. How have the different firms responded to the various different impacts on the pandemic? Well, if you take if you take my non-executive um, portfolio, if you if you look at the leadership development world, um, you know, we in within 72 hours of the pandemic hitting the UK, we saw most of our clients cancelling or postponing their work. Fortunately, when we got a few months into the pandemic, um, the more enlightened realised that there was never more a more important time to have people helping you with the challenges of leadership and performance. In the, I chair the the Scottish Salmon, which is the UK's largest food exporter. That sector was very disrupted because about 60%, we, we make about a billion pounds worth of Scottish salmon every year and the vast majority of it goes to export. And of course, the markets were closed, the borders were closed, the restaurants were closed, and that um, sector was really faced um, grinding to a halt. I'm also the audit chair in a cinema business, and I think the cinema industry might be one that may never be the same again, may never indeed recover. The whole model uh, may change and um, the the curtains fell in our cinemas in late March 2020 and they've not risen again since. And then in the executive coaching world, again, I think that was um, a moment for that sector 
because the enlightened leaders um, never needed executive coaches more. They needed the time to take a breath, to reflect, to have someone to hold a mirror up um, to what they were doing. So it's vastly different experiences. And I think that's what most business leaders have experienced. It's been a land of opportunity and there's been a land of desperation. And do you think mindset's got a lot to do with that as well? Well, my mindset was absolutely fascinating in the 28 um, leaders that I met. I'm going to tell you about one of them. There's a 28-year-old venture capitalist called Pocket Sun, who's uh, based in Singapore, was born in China, does a lot of, went to university in the States and discovered that only 2.8% of venture capital goes to female entrepreneurs in the States. And she pledged to change that, created a fund which um, supported solely um, female entrepreneurs and then pointed that fund at opportunities in the crisis from a healthcare, a home testing healthcare company in Texas to an online wedding dress company to a death care company and to a company that um, helped young people with their mental health. So her mindset was all about opportunity. And the great entrepreneurs um, who I interviewed for the book, even though their businesses sat in tatters round about them, they weren't despondent. They were working at how to build back, use that phrase, how to build back better. And they were looking at where the opportunities were that were coming out of the crisis. And I guess that's what sets entrepreneurs aside from those who are just content and happy to be working in corporate jobs versus driving their own agenda, driving their own thoughts. And, and Pocket Sun is one of those people you quote quite a bit during the book in terms of how she's approached her her work and her teams and, and taken advantage of the opportunity. Yeah, and, and um, it's maybe another uh, definition of uh, being an entrepreneur, isn't it? It's people who are addicted to opportunity. Mm. It's the old adage, isn't it? It's not about the event it's how you react and respond to the event that gives you your outcomes absolutely um and you know in that era of opportunity i i worked a lot um in the past with sir brian Souter, who was the founder of um, the stagecoach transport uh, empire and he talks very passionately about dynamics and mechanics dynamics being the ideas the vision and the creativity of the entrepreneur but how it always needs to be balanced with the mechanics of process and compliance and conformity and rules and that is one of the secrets to successfully growing uh, an organization into the scale you know the one stage stagecoach was a billion pound plus business it's that balance between dynamics and mechanics and constantly getting that in the right place i like that's a nice lens to look through so we're, we're now a year into the pandemic and when you first penned the book leaders in lockdown it was just as we were emerging through that first wave if you like of what the pandemic brought to us and when we last met we were had the anticipation that we'd be sat here a year in almost and on a new trajectory in a new direction but we kind of still, still seem to be not too far further forward than where we were before albeit of course we've got the vaccination and we have some light at the end of the tunnel so how have folk responded to the book well people have been very kind about the book um, the reviews have been very kind about it, and I've kind of moved. Uh, it's been it's been shortlisted in the Business Book Awards, uh, which was very um, very nice, but um, rather surprising. Uh, but I've kind of moved in a way from being an author to being a bit of an evangelist around the the themes in the book. Uh, and you're right in in what you say about we thought we would be in a different place by now. I mean, I share one secret with you, Steve. When we decided to do this book. Our biggest concern was that people would have forgotten about um, COVID. Would it still be current and relevant when it was published in the autumn of 2020? And here we are in the spring of 2021 and lockdown is still going strong uh, in the UK. And as you say, we've not really emerged perhaps and seen the full impact 
particularly in terms of unemployment and businesses going bust mm. uh, because we're being propped up by um, government money in the private sector That's all right. over the place. Yeah. And throughout the book, you interviewed senior executives, thought leaders from around the world. And in doing so, you found that there were about seven broad themes that were consistently present. And I thought it might be useful just to maybe spin through those seven themes and we can maybe dig into a couple as we go. Sure. So the seven themes were really a bringing together um, of the commonalities uh, between the 28 business leaders. Theme number one is the new age of purpose, because um, there was a common view that purpose was um, has never been a more important time for purpose. And you saw businesses who were very purpose focused, really flourishing, and that leaders thought that coming out of COVID purpose would no longer be just a line or two to emblazon on your website and and forget about. So they're predicting a new age where purpose really matters and purpose really counts in terms of engaging your employees um, and engaging your clients and customers. Theme number two was the new world of work. And um, obviously, the piece that has been most um, discussed and written about there was moving many, many millions of people from offices to home. But the new world of work is going to be far more than that. It is going to be how we cope with this hybrid uh, way of working, which most people predict will come out of it. And also, I think it's made people ask themselves, people of all generations ask themselves, what is work? And I think that will result in a complete redrawing of the psychological contract Mm. between employer and employee. Theme number three was tackling inequality because at every level COVID exposed um, inequality, not just through um, the inequality of homeschooling, the inequality of the vaccine, the inequality of whom the, um, the COVID killed. And coming out of it, um, you're going to see inequality widen in all areas of society. And this was really a feeling from business leaders that they had to play their part. What were they doing about tackling the black hole of unemployment? Um, were they really serious about diversity and inclusion? Um, were they just making people redundant or were they considering um, a new mindset towards reskilling people. It's really been stark, hasn't it? This one particular, because it, it's really shone a light on where companies were focused around diversity, inclusion, and inequalities, and where they haven't. And that that, that void has just become bigger in my experience. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And in all of these things, you know, the theory is that it's up to the corporate world and it's up to leaders in the corporate world to try and move in and tackle this because frankly um, a lot of our politicians and our governments um, are not doing a good enough job on these issues and that was very strong in the fourth theme which is global cooperation Um, and at a moment that we wanted our politicians to be looking across boundaries, to be working together with other nations to tackle this terrible pandemic. They turned inwards, they set nation against nation. And this wasn't just China and the US. I think you saw this in many, many governments um, around the world. You saw it across Europe. And the feeling really from, particularly from the leaders of big corporates, that it was the big corporations um, in the future who had a strong and effective role in tackling the global problems because our, we couldn't rely on our politicians to do it. Um, theme um, number five was resilience, not just financial resilience or operational resilience, not just the personal resilience of how we as individuals got through a crisis which has gone on for so long. Theme number six was all about resetting the supply chain and the principle that we need to move away. I mean, the the global supply chain ground to halt and we need to move away from just in time and uh, move to just in case and the belief that we can do that and save money and that the pandemic had exposed weaknesses in supply chains, which really had developed over decades. And those weaknesses are there because supply chain decisions were made about efficiency and the lowest cost. And that didn't stand up to scrutiny when we had the global pandemic that closed borders. And interestingly, also, it's 
in the whole kind of efficiency, lean management, call it what you will, in terms of squeezing that supply chain has proven also to stifle innovation and creativity in doing so. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it wasn't very efficient uh, when the supply chain ground to a halt. One of the other areas in there, which I just touch upon, but I find quite fascinating, is a suggestion that as a result of the pandemic, you could see a lot of manufacturing moving back from Asia to Europe and to the US, but it wouldn't be carried out um, by human beings. It would be being carried out by robots. And then the final theme, which is very much in in, in our world, Steve, we described as uh, maximizing potential. And this this was the bit where um, Lena Nair, who's the chief HR officer of uh, Unilever, suggested that we'd seen the end of the Superman leader, and she did mean the Superman leader, and the start of a new era, era of empathetic listening and compassionate leadership and how that was the most effective way to lead in the pandemic and after the pandemic and a number of other themes just running in there about executive preparedness you know we were confronted with no longer was it an option to look after ourselves physically because we couldn't get through this and, and unless we did no longer is it an option to take or leave the issue of mental health for executives and for the rest of the workforce. And it also exposed that where leaders did have executive coaches or mentors um, who gave them time to catch breath, they made better decisions. They made better decisions if they had someone who could hold a mirror um, up to them. So those those were the the seven themes. There's so much to unpack in yeah. in each one, but that's that's what the leaders in lockdown were telling us. And what you also found as part of your research and your conversations was a new way to help leaders think. And you created a model called Lead. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the so the the, the leader leading model um, I've played with quite a bit, and I suppose it comes back to maybe a bit of my journalistic background. And we, we created the leading model really by asking executive coaches, where are the areas that you find yourself coaching executives most? And uh, they described these as being um, the blockers to people moving to the next level uh, and also the enablers to people moving to the next level. And the L in, uh, in leading uh, is for looking like a leader. Um, so the behaviors, um, the gravitas, the persona, um, the actions of a leader. The E was round about empowerment and uh, empathy and emotional intelligence. The A was awareness and particularly self-awareness. The D was delivery, getting things done. The I is impact, um, your communication style, your brevity, your clarity, your impact. The N is for nurturing and the G is for game changing. Do you, as a leader, really change the game or do you only create uh, incremental change? Given the fact that the pandemic has changed the game for all of us, this is a perfect opportunity for all leaders to reframe and rebase their game, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think if it calls into question um, everything uh, that has gone before um, in the way that we run our businesses, um, I think it calls into question the way that we lead. And, and you know, in the environment, the, the pace of change that will come now um, and will not slow down in the future, the agility that's required in leadership, we need to reframe the, the behaviours um, of the leaders that we have. Thinking about the examples that you were shared with you by the leaders that you interviewed, as well as your own experiences, you kind of captured this in the last chapter of your book called Maximizing Potential. So now's the chance for us to do that. But what's the reason in your experience, some will grab the opportunity and run into the uncertainty and the ambiguity, but others will maybe avoid it? So th- I think the the reasons leader do leaders do things and you know, we know this from executive coaching is it is it comes back to past experience and to lead leader know yourself doesn't it um and you know we work a lot with 
psychometric analysis of black isle group i'm sure that that's a place where you probably start with a lot of your yep. um coaching absolutely so if you look for the reasons why particular leaders do a particular thing or don't do a particular thing then you have to go to the inner game uh, to get your answer and quite often when you go to the inner game of the leader the answers are really quite startlingly obvious yeah, I call it the voice in your head. Absolutely. The one that you wake up with, the one that you go to bed with, and yeah. it'll be the last voice you hear when you leave the planet yeah. as well. So it's got to be an empowering voice. Yeah. So the next part of the show, we'd love to hack into your years of experience and diverse experience to kind of try and distill some top tips and ideas for our listeners. So if you had to distill them, what would be your top three leadership hacks? Well, number one top hack for me, very apparent uh, during the pandemic, was you need to create the space to think and to reflect. If your agenda is absolutely packed full, you will be denying yourself the, one of the most important things about leadership, which is the time to think and the time to reflect. Uh, leadership number two, uh, you must have someone um, who will tell you the uncomfortable truths. There's a, a Scottish poet called Robert Burns, and I won't, I won't do this, um, this bit of poetry uh, in, in Scottish. Uh, I'll, I'll translate it into English. Go for it. And it basically says, uh, would someone the power to give us to see ourselves as others see us, it would from many a blunder free us and foolish notion. And we're surrounded by leaders, I'm afraid, who live in a hall of mirrors with people telling them mm. what they want to hear in an echo chamber, which leads to narcissistic and blind leadership. So um, anyone who's listening to this who aspires to further leadership, get yourself someone who will be your conscience. I love that. Who will see yourselves as others see us and will challenge you. And, you know, I, I had this, I'll give you a good example of this with one of the people I was coaching through the, the pandemic whose automatic reaction was at the start was to act very quickly and make a large number of people redundant. And I got that person to stop in their tracks by asking them, well, what is your responsibility to society right at this moment? Mm. And will that help? by making a large number of people redundant? Or will it just mean that they can't pay their mortgages, um, they default, the economy goes into a further downward spiral? So he went to the people and he said, what solutions do you have to this issue? And they put their hands up and they said, we'll job share, you know, we'll take a reduction in our salary, we'll, um, some of us will take temporary leave. Um, and you know, that that to me is uh, the result of someone who is, is telling you the uncomfortable truths as a leader. Yeah. And how powerful is it that you, by having that conversation, managed to r help that individual reframe and actually give control to the people who could make those right decisions? It It is, but it's relatively easy for us because we are not um, in the centre of the dogfight of trying to save the business. You know, I'm I'm walking on the beach, uh, thinking, you know, what on earth is going to happen here? I have that time to to reflect, um, and I'm I'm here to challenge. Uh, I'm no longer a player in the game. Uh, I'm an observer from the from the sideline. You're right. However, part of creating the space to be a great leader is creating the space to think absolutely and however busy we are it's about reprioritizing and giving us that freedom and that room to kick the leaves about metaphorically yeah and and you know first thing i would do as an executive coach is, is to ask to see the the leader's diary and if there's no thinking time in it i challenge that the next thing i would do is to try and see is the time in the diary actually aligned to the objectives the main objectives and the main aims of the leader and most of the time it isn't exactly exactly right so you know the lead leader will tell you that they want to do a b and c and so well actually you've got no time in that because you're doing operational stuff you're doing stuff that one of your directors could do um you know and you're spending time uh, doing stuff which you shouldn't be doing at all so hack number three hack number three 
be purpose led. And again, I think the pandemic uh, underlines uh, the importance of purpose. So find your purpose as an individual and ensure that your business has found its purpose and that the people in your business know what that purpose is and believe in that purpose. Because, you know, I think COVID reminds us that without purpose, we're we're empty vessels. Yeah, very much so. And it's interesting, when I, and I don't know if you found this in the work that you've done, but, but purpose always seems to be the one that is most alluring for folk, but yet most underinvested in, in terms of just granularity and understanding. Absolutely. And I think that that is hopefully something that will come out of COVID. I mean, I, I worked with somebody the other day who was from an extremely well-known brand, and um, they told me with a bit of pride that, yes, yes, we were on the case with um, Purpose and this had helped them through the pandemic. But then revealed that they got on the case with Purpose about 12 months before the pandemic started. Uh, and I, I was fa- I was fairly shocked. Mm-hmm. So it's, that underlines um, your theory that, uh, you know, real understanding and real embedding of purpose um, in the corporate world is still pretty sadly lacking. And also purpose can change. Absolutely. Given the environment and experiences. And you need to reevaluate that just as you do with your strategy. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I chair um, UK Coaching, which um, works with um, sports coaches and community coaches, essentially as a learning and development, a business that champions coaches. Um, and in a way, COVID has helped to crystallise um, our purpose because the nation will not recover and the health of the nation will not recover um, unless we protect and increase um, activity, movement, um, exercise and sport. And all of a sudden that organisation has become the catalyst through which that is done because it isn't done without coaches. That's right. So so the the, the purpose has been crystallised and indeed the purpose is much clearer, hopefully, for the people in that business. The next part of the show our listeners have become familiar with is called Hack to Attack. So this is where something typically hasn't gone well. It could have been catastrophic. It could be in your personal life or your work. But as a result of the experience, that's now helping us in a positive way. What would be your Hack to Attack? Well, my Hack to Attack um, is based in catastrophic failure. And I go back a long time, but I was asked to speak at a convention of uh, local councillors um, and I said to the people who was organising you know what what do you want or oh, we want a kind of business thing dun, 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 dun. And, you know, are you sure you've got the right person yes we definitely got the right person when I turned up on the night the person who was chairing the event said well I hope you're going to be funnier than that Dara O'Brien I said well, what do you mean well we had him last year and he wasn't very funny I did not have a, <laughs> a com- I did not have a comic speech prepared. So I tried to think of a comic speech while um, eating my uh, my beef or chicken, and uh, I, I think I probably went down pretty well like a lead balloon. Uh, managed to just escape uh, with my life, um, and it was pretty. Um, how could I put it? I was pretty down about the whole thing would be an understatement so it did it did impact <laughs> quite quite badly on me i can imagine yeah and, and i vowed to, to become a, a more competent communicator performer presenter speaker and now one of my specialities is is helping other people to communicate with brevity clarity and impact but it could have gone either way and, and it, it's quite interesting i, I quite like biopics yeah, and I was watching a biopic the other night about Audrey Hepburn, and uh, the failure that Audrey Hepburn had in her early life um, were quite marked. And as we see, I think with all uh, good leaders, good stars, that is the way you bounce back from that. Totally, failure is what makes uh, the woman or the man. And that's the whole premise of Hack to Attack. It's that you know there is there always will be adversity, there'll be failures, but if we reframe them as learning, yeah. it helps propel us forward. Yeah. So you know we 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 all want to be good. Uh, I, th- I think we all want to be good uh, and influential performers, presenters, communicators. 
So my hack to attack is say, you will bomb. Yeah. You will bomb several times and just learn from it and crack on. Awesome. Well, one of my favorite parts of the show is the next bit we get to do with you, which is to do a bit of time travel. And you now get to go to bump into Athol at 21 and give them some advice. So what's it going to be? Well, I think two bits of advice. I think whatever your ambitions are at 21, um, you're not being ambitious enough. Because I think when you're 21, you have no idea what you're actually capable of. And I think leaders seem to be, depending on what your background is, um, leaders seem to be people who are in positions that perhaps you won't achieve. So er early imposter syndrome at 21, and it's only when you get uh, into the latter part of your career Mm. that uh, you realize that, well, there are obvious key skills in leadership. Many, many, many people who uh, never imagine uh, lives in leadership are actually extremely capable of doing them and uh, you know sir david behan who's the executive chair of hc1 care homes he had a thousand people died in his care homes in the first hundred days of lockdown he's brilliant on this and how he sees he saw leadership at every level in his care homes and leadership's not um a title so i think that that would be one thing that i would definitely say to Athol at 21. I think the other thing I would say, which came a little bit mid-career for me, is um, to think international, to get to get yourself um, uh, an international um, outlook, because the, the way that we do business um, globally now, I think, uh, is, is the key for many, many people and the opportunities of that. So I would get a global outlook early on. So think, think big, think global. And crack on. Awesome. Love it. So what's next for you and Big R Group? Well, um just in the in the immediate future, um, you know, I was saying I've become a bit of an evangelist for these messages in the Leaders in Lockdown book. So we've developed Leaders in Lockdown workshops and we're taking them out to businesses and out to business groups. And it's um it's more about leading out of lockdown. And we're trying to help individuals and to help organizations. Uh, We're doing quite a lot of this um, free of charge because I honestly think that uh, there's so much that businesses have to cope with in the next 12 months and beyond that the business community needs to rally around together and, uh, and help each other. So short term, it's doing leaders in lockdown workshops and um, doing one tonight with uh, global chief information officers. I'm really enjoying uh, and doing them. Um, and then beyond that, um, we maybe think about what the next book is that we can write. Be leaders out of lockdown. <laughs> leaders out of <laughs> lockdown. Well, I, I'm quite drawn. I must admit, there's two, there's two places that I'm quite drawn to. I'm quite drawn to, learning more from the world's most interesting leaders. So they're not necessarily the, the the leaders who have the most prominent positions, but the ones who are challenging uh, what we're doing across uh, business. So I think that might be quite an interesting book. Mm. And I, I also have a bit of a fascination uh, about the narcissistic leader. Yeah. Uh, and not not because I like them, but because... I think more and more we want to be able to identify them and uh, make sure that uh, uh, we learn from them and we try and stop their rise to the top because the shareholder damage, the the damage of value, the damage of society from narcissistic political leaders uh, is utterly colossal Mm -hmm. uh, over time. And it's it's a failure of all of us not to spot these people and weed them out and they're still present in our communities and in our workplaces uh, and it's spotting some of those traits that will help us call them out and Absolutely. yeah love it so as folk have been listening to this they've probably been thinking how do i get myself a copy of leaders in lockdown and where can i find a little bit more about athol's work where should we send them well um Leaders in Lockdown is available on Amazon. I would say it's available in all good bookshops, but most good bookshops are closed at the moment. So the great god Amazon is probably the best place to go. Uh, Book Depository um, 
uh, if you're elsewhere in the world because I think they deliver um, free of charge. If you want to find out more about Black Isle Group, just check out uh, blackislegroup.com and there's a little bit more about me on atholduncan.com. That's Athol with uh, two L's. And the great thing about having a slightly unusual name like Athol is if you stick it in Google, you find me quite quickly. Yeah, can't can't be many Athol Duncans around. Not too many. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's been a super pleasure talking to you. I'm grateful for you taking time out of a busy schedule to be with us. And we're delighted that you're part of our Leadership Packer community. So, Athel Duncan, thank you very much for being on the show. Steve, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Athel. I genuinely want to say a heartfelt thanks for taking time out of your day to listen in too. We do this in the service of helping others and spreading the word of leadership. Without you listening in, there would be no show. So please subscribe now if you haven't done so already. Share this podcast with your communities and network and help us develop a community and a tribe of leadership hackers. And finally, if you'd like me to work with your senior team, your leadership community, keynote an event, or you would like to sponsor an episode, please connect with us via our social media. And you can do that by following and liking our pages on Twitter and Facebook. Our handle there is at Leadership Hacker. Instagram, you can find us there at the underscore leadership underscore hacker and at YouTube, we're just Leadership Hacker. So that's me signing off. I'm Steve Rush and I've been the Leadership Hacker.